means, amongst other things, I have a set of cards, which is fantastic. I'm watching the Women's World Cup at the moment, so I hope I don't have to use the red card. Uh, <laughs> I have no yellow card, so, but I've got greens and blues. Um, so we're going to start. Uh, we have uh, five speakers, if I'm counting correctly, so tw 20 minutes each, so it's uh, a tight schedule. We're going to start with uh, Andrea Bastianin from the University of Milano Biocca. Um, so you're currently assistant professor uh, of econometrics. Uh, I don't have any more information on that, but I'm sure you can introduce yourself. Uh, but you're working on notably on themes of energy and environmental economics related to uh, uh, econometrics. So I'll let you say a few more words about your passions and hobbies, but uh, above all, your findings from the HL LHEC program. So uh, let me thank you, first of all, Johannes, for having me here, and not just for that, but also for uh, an endless exchange of emails and uh, a number of uh, Skype, uh, Skype calls in which uh, we, it really helped us to uh, build the, the, the results that I'm going to use in this presentation. Uh, having said that, let me start with the very first question that came to my mind when Massimo Florio involved me in this uh, project. Because I could see the potential of running a cost-benefit analysis, but as an economist, as an econometrician, who basically is an economist that uses a lot of data, uh, um, the first question that came to my mind is, what do economists have to do with CERN? And as I got involved in the project, I soon realized that CERN and big science center in general are, uh, provide a unique opportunities to economists to advance their theories and test some of them. Just to give you a few examples, the kind of data that uh, are collected while uh, doing uh, uh, normal activities in big size centers are a blessing for empirical economists, where they, use, they can use this data to test any theories that it comes to, my, to, to their mind, such as the one that Massimo mentioned to, today about patents, about uh, incremental profits, and so on and so forth. But even if you are more a management guy, this is extremely important because uh, uh, the governance structure of such huge and complex systems is extremely important for management, people doing management. And last but not least, this is more close to my kind of research, uh, even if you are a macroeconomist, you should care because uh, innovation and breakthrough technology that get produced while advancing science are sometimes among the driver of models that macroeconomists use to explain long-term growth and business cycle fluctuations. So having answered this, let me, uh, let, let me put there this claim that I think most of, all, most of us agree, because we are in this section about uh, uh, the economics of science. Uh, and the claim is the following. Good economics leads to good policy decision. Uh, if we agree on this claim, uh, I will, go, uh, I will conclude my presentation with a simple question. If econ economics can be good to big science center, let's see what big science centers can do to do good economic analysis. Now, <clears throat> starting uh, in, uh, getting into the detail of the analysis of the cost-benefit analysis, I will uh, use this graph that I borrowed from the FCC uh, design report in which you have this uh, so-called onion, onion model, I think it's called, uh, in which basically you have a, a, a graphical uh, description of the parties involved by a particle accelerator, the parties that we can uh, take into account when running a, a cost-benefit analysis. Starting from the core of the onion, we have the physical community, the physics community, and as we move uh, to more external layers, we have uh, the society at large. So the main idea of a cost-benefit analysis is to identify who are the stakeholders, who are the guys who benefit from a big science center, from a research infrastructure. With the social cost-benefit analysis, we have uh, a strong methodology uh, with a lot of theory behind, uh, in which we, can, we are able to quantify and analyze, project, the social cost and benefits arising from a research infrastructure. Let me stress the word social because here we are not doing a financial analysis. We are doing an analysis that involves the benefits, for, the benefits and costs for the society. 
just to give you an idea, uh, talking about cost, we would include, for instance, the cost of pollution, the, the cost of an externality called pollution, if the research infrastructure will produce pollution. Um, so with the social cost-benefit analysis, we are able to provide information to policymakers. What we are not able to do is to compare different research infrastructure on the relative scientific merit of different research infrastructure. We are able to provide information for each research infrastructure, but we cannot tell you what is more promising in terms of science. Uh, Massim has already covered this, so there is a little bit of overlapping. Uh, but let me just stress that uh, uh, the methodology is sound and it has been recognized to, of, to be sound by policymakers. We have the guide that Massimo was mentioning. We have uh, the fact that cost-benefit analysis is a requirement for financing major research infrastructure. Um, a little bit more of a background on the cost-benefit analysis of the uh, high luminosity program. Uh, first of all, we are relying on previous results from this paper, here you have a typo, this is 2016, not 2007, uh, of the LHC uh, program, of the LHC, LHC accelerator at CERN. In the subsequent analysis here, of course, you see just my name and the name of Massimo, but there are dozens of people who have contributed to this analysis. Uh, we extend their methodology, we extend their results to uh, have a proper methodology that suits well the high luminosity upgrade, the, the cost benefit analysis of the high luminosity upgrade. Uh, let, me stress you that, let me stress that while doing this analysis, we have, produ we have produced a bunch of reports that are freely available on the website of CERN, uh, covering all the methodological details underlying the analysis, as well as a final report that uh, overviews how the cost-benefit analysis of, the FCC, of different FCC scenarios could be carried out relying on this methodology. It is not, a, let me stress that this final report is not a cost-benefit analysis, it's just a methodological report. Uh, so once again, this has been possible with the collaboration of several people at CERN, University of Milan, including some of people here, Silvia, Irene, Johannes, I've already mentioned him, and Massimo, of course. Okay, now, details about this project. Now, one of the main difficult that, difficulties that we have to face uh, when analyzing the high luminosity upgrade is uh, a comparison. A comparison of this uh, project with a counterfactual scenario in which you basically have CERN without the high luminosity upgrade. So in that case, we have uh, designed this counterfactual scenario together with people at CERN. Of course, we have, we have, we have been told what would make sense in, for CERN without the luminosity uh, upgrade. And we are going to call this counterfactual scenario as operating, operating the LHC under normal consolidation. Uh, let me uh, spend a couple of words more on this. What is this counterfactual scenario? This counterfactual scenario is uh, you have LHC there, you still continue to use it up to a certain point. After that point, you stop using it because it's useless from, a physic, from the physics point of view, uh, but it remains there, so you still have some maintenance cost due to the fact that you have to provide such, such security, ventilation, and, and stuff like that. Uh, of course, you also have some residual benefits as the, the time goes by, but these benefits, I will, as I will illustrate later, are going to disappear over time. So basically, these two graphs are a sketch of the two scenarios. Uh, what I want to highlight in these two graphs is that up to 14, 2014, uh, the two scenarios are the same. These are the LHC program. From that point on, the two scenarios start to diverge. Here you have the high luminosity upgrade. Here you have these uh, operating the LHC under uh, normal consolidation. The methodology, this has already been covered by Massimo, so I will be very quick on this. Uh, but let me stress a different point uh, uh, with respect to what Massimo said. Uh, here, I want to repeat a little bit. Uh, the main object of interest in a cost-benefit analysis is the net present value. Okay, the net present value is the difference between the benefits generated by the infrastructure and the social cost of the infrastructure, the project more generally. Uh, the different point that I want to make, the different thing that I want to stress here is this uh, 
expectation operator. So what does it mean? It means that while running a cost-benefit analysis, we are making a lot of assumptions, okay? Of course, most of these assumptions are uncertain at best. So in, a, in an attempt to inject some randomness in, the, in our estimate of the net present value, we are assuming some distribution for the underlying parameters that we are using in the cost-benefit analysis, and we are trying to estimate the distribution of the net present value with the Monte Carlo analysis. But overall, the story is very simple. A cost-benefit analysis test is passed by a research infrastructure if the net present value is greater than zero. When you apply this story to our analysis, which involves two scenarios, it means that the difference between the net present value of the high luminosity scenario and the net present value of the counterfactual scenario has to be greater than zero. Okay? Now, let me go over this counting once again. Now, all the results, all the numbers that are, are in our tables are discounted values, okay? So meaning that the, the, that is the value of the investment flows and cost at 2016, okay? In doing so, we are using this thing here, which is called discount rate, okay? Let me start telling you what is not the discount rate. The discount rate is not the policy rate set by monetary uh, authorities. So it, is not, it has nothing to do with the uh, European Central Bank. What is, it, what, what is this animal here is uh, a sort of preference of present over the future. So uh, we take the value of one euro in 2016, and it means that having 3% as a, reference, as a reference value, this one euro in 2016 worth 0 0.5 euro in 2038, because you prefer to consume now rather than in the future, of course. Benefits, okay? Most of these benefits have already been covered uh, uh, by Massimo. Luckily, without any coordination, I'm going to stress uh, another, uh, the, 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 the two benefits that Massimo stressed uh, less uh, before in his presentation. So, um, in our analysis, we consider a, a very wide array of benefits, <clears throat> starting from the benefits for scientists in terms of preprints and publications. Then we are considering this very important class of benefits, which is uh, benefits arising to uh, early stage researchers at CERN in terms of incremental wage over their career. Uh, early stage researchers, just to be precise, include students, include PhD students, technical students, and users at the collaboration. Maybe I'm missing someone. <laughs> okay. Uh, as for firms, we consider two main classes of benefits. Technological spillover in terms of increased uh, profits for collaborating firms and free ICT available to the society. General public, here we have an endless list of benefits, including tourist arrival at CERN. And this is the public good value of science that Massimo already uh, told you before. Let's move directly into the results of the analysis, okay? Now, what, I, what you have here is the cost-benefit analysis for the ILUMI, the cost-benefit analysis for the counterfactual scenario in which you have the LHC there, but you are, not more, you are no more investing in that. And here you have the difference between the two, okay? I want to start from these numbers here, okay? This is the net present value, so the main object of interest. What you can see here that luckily, in all cases, this net present value, the baseline net present value, so no Monte Carlo involved here, is positive, okay? Second element that I want to stress here is this number, which is called benefit cost ratio, which is in all cases, with different magnitude, greater than one, okay? So for instance, if you take the difference, you have 1.7, it means that uh, the, in terms of additional benefits generated by, by the, um, by the ILUMI scenario, uh, each dollar, each euro that you invest, you get 1.7 back. Uh, now I will focus a little more on two main classes of benefits. So those are those related with human capital 
and those related to technological spillovers, okay? Which, as you can see, are about 42, if you consider the difference, and 37 of the total benefits arising from the iLumi. So they are the two most important categories. Um, just to give you the intuition, uh, the benefits for early stage researchers is the number of uh, researchers times the year, an estimate of the incremental salary that they get from CERN, and this is uh, actualized, this is discounted, okay? The, as, you, as you have been told by Massimo, this incremental salary arises because there are additional skills that uh, these guys uh, gain when working at CERN, okay? Now, here is the mechanism through which we have uh, an additional uh, benefit in the iLumi scenario. So basically, this blue line is the number of early stage researchers uh, up to 2038 in the iLumi scenario. This is the counterfactual. What happens here? It happens that without any upgrade of the machine, basically CERN loses attractivity. Therefore, these people will move to someone, some other place or some other uh, project within CERN. Uh, this difference generates this uh, economic value, which is highlighted by the green bars you can see here. Now, very quickly on the technological spillovers, we consider two classes of spillover. Let me start from, from the bottom, okay? Uh, the, uh, in this, in, this has to do with uh, the availability of ICT uh, technology. We consider three main classes of uh, uh, benefits in this category. The availability of routes for free, the availability of jam for free, and the availability of other free ICT that have to do with storage and other solutions that are required for the iLumi. Okay? Now, what I want to stress here that whatever number I've shown there, probably that number is an underestimate of the true value of, 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 these, uh, of benefits arising because of this. Why? Because it is almost impossible to get uh, a complete list of what is needed for the future, and it is really, really uh, uh, difficult. Even though uh, the, the most recent uh, uh, analysis that Massimo showed you today confirmed that there are benefits, of course. In terms of technological spillover, here the intuition is simple. Basically, the, the, the value for collaborating firm is proportional to the share of iTech procurement that they uh, get from CERN. And this share of iTech procurement is higher within the iLumi scenario than within the counterfactual scenario. And this generates uh, this benefit. So basically, you have the value the, of the procurement times the share of benefits, uh, the share of high-tech procurement times a multiplier, which tells you how much you get back from working with CERN, times the incremental profits. Now, in terms of the Monte Carlo, just let me show you how it works. It works like that. Basically, uh, for each of these parameters, or for some of these parameters, we have a distribution, okay? We draw from that distribution and we run the cost-benefit analysis again and again. So to have inferences about the output of the CBI that are of, of interest. These are 15 things that uh, we assumed as being uh, stochastic and that have been involved in the simulation. And let me show you here the simulated uh, cumulative density function of the net present value. I just want you to highlight, uh, I just want to highlight that this black line is the baseline value. So the baseline value that we get from the CBA without any Monte Carlo. Another number that is interesting is what you get from looking at zero here, okay? If you look at zero here and then you move here to here, what you get is an estimate of the probability of observing a positive net present value, which is about uh, 87%, okay? Given that I'm running out of time, I will skip this and I will move to the conclusion. Uh, and the conclusion, uh, I try to answer this try to provide a very partial uh, and skewed answer to, to this question. What can Big Science Center do to improve economic analysis? Uh, well, let me tell you, first of all, that CERN has been very collaborative. Nevertheless, they, are, they were not ready to collect the kind of data needed by economists to do serious methodological, uh, um, rigorous methodological analysis. So we have to work, put a lot, uh, a lot of extra amount to reach the kind of data that we needed. Nevertheless, we managed to have empirical evidence of benefits based on um, econometric methods. So my, my main claim is that if you want uh, these results, what 
what, the, what you need is to improve data collection and to improve uh, the, the internalize in a way the fact that sooner or later you will need economic analysis. That's it for, for me. Thanks very much, Andrea. Is there one or two questions? Uh, trying to keep into time for Andrea. Question at the back there. I don't know if we have a second mic. If not, uh, ah, we do. Hi. Thank you very much for the talk. So you mentioned that we need to improve the data acquisition. So what are the, the methods or the options to improve it? What are the, the methods? Of, well, the, the, the main answer is a very general answer. I mean, uh, simply from the fact that uh, if you recognize that economic analysis is needed, uh, you need to talk with economists, as we did uh, with uh, Johannes, and we understand each other in terms of data availability. So. There are, we use a lot of data produced by CERN, but just by chance because of their administrative needs. Maybe if there is a, a continuous uh, communication with big science centers, between big science centers and economists, we can, we can do something better. For instance, economists nowadays are really pushing the, 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 the causality analysis, so we are very advanced in terms of providing causality analysis. And having such uh, results need to have very good data that now are not available, not easily available. I don't know from, from where the question came, but I can give actually an answer, yeah, what has to be done. It's very simple, socioeconomic impact assessment has to be uh, legitimated from the top down. So it is the directorate that has to say that the organization has to carry out socioeconomic impact assessment and that the data have to be collected. For instance, for the training, we need simply uh, to have a tracking of the students who come to CERN and be allowed and have enough resources to track them three, four, five years after they leave and inquire, for instance, in which industries they go and what salaries they have. Typical typical task of an alumni network, for instance. Okay, thank you. Want to say um, to, to follow up on this morning's discussion, uh, is it true to say that since the expenditure comes now and the benefits come later, in fact, if you would not do uh, discounting, you would even have much bigger, benefit, uh, much bigger returns? Yeah, it's yes. true. it is true, but yeah. it is also but true that if I ask you, would you prefer a... No, no, I know, I know discounting, okay. but... <laughs> But then, then the, the question, second okay. question is, <laughs> what is the impact of the discounting rate? If you, have you tried to play with this parameter? Uh, no, in, the, in this setting, we have not tried to mm. include it in the Monte Carlo analysis, but it's, uh, I mean, it's just a proportional factor. So it wouldn't change the, the results, I think, in the end. Ah, but it could change the differential uh, by large amounts. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. OK, uh, any more questions at the stage? Thanks very much, Andre. You're welcome. Okay. The second uh, presenter this afternoon is uh, Silvia Vignetti from CSIL in Milan. So you've seen Silvia earlier because she was playing my, my job uh, in the morning session. Um, so Silvia is part of the RIPAS team, so we're working together on that. Uh, more importantly, she's uh, an expert in planning and evaluation of major infrastructure projects, including CBA. She's over 20 years of experience uh, and will now give you an insight into uh, designing a research infrastructure with impact in mind. Thank you, Sylvia. Okay. Thank you for this introduction. Thank you for inviting me. And thanks also to Andrea Bastianin, who will get the right hints for uh, my presentation, because I will talk precisely about data collection, about having a plan in mind well before the start of an impact assessment in order to be prepared to perform an impact assessment. So I will briefly uh, discuss the motivation of why we need to think about the impact um, well ahead before we actually observe and uh, the impact materializes. Uh, what does it mean to have, a, uh, to have an impact assessment plan? So we have discussed this morning about having the necessary financial resources for impact assessment, to have the skills and the competence. But if you have financial resources and the skills but you don't have a plan, then it's not very useful. And a plan can also support you in understanding how much money you need and what type of skills and competences you need. 
And then I will pretty much focus about the data collection, a possible data collection strategy, which are the relevant indicators, and especially what you have to do to collect such indicators. So we start with the rationale. Why do we need to think in advance about uh, performing impact assessment? The evidence tells us that there is, as we have discussed this morning, an increasing demand of performing socioeconomic impact assessment as one of the justification for funding new research infrastructure. So already in the preparatory phase, research infrastructure managers are increasingly called to prove that they are prepared to deliver impact. Um, at the same time, um, the discussion that we have with the RI managers and also the evidence is coming from, from a survey that we have carried out in the context of the uh, RI path project tells us that impact assessments are performed episodically and only as a response to an external request uh, from the stakeholders or from the funding agencies. Um, there is in many cases, a lack of internal resources and expertise on how to do that or how to even initiate the exercise. And then there is a need, once you have decided to undertake this exercise, there is a need for, for deep understanding and collaborations of the people inside the research infrastructure with the experts that have to carry out the impact assessment. So, the idea is that if you plan an impact assessment exercise in advance, you are prepared in the moment when you have to carry it out on how to do that in the best way. And it has useful also as a strategic management tool. So it's not only to respond to the request of stakeholders and funding agencies, but it can become a, a, a truly uh, useful management tool for re uh, research infrastructure managers. So I picked up here, I was looking for a definition of impact assessment. I picked up here something uh, from the uh, International Association of Impact Assessment. I didn't know even that this association is there. I wanted to have a very general and broad definition. If you look, there are many other different definitions. If you look at the European Commission impact assessment in the context of the European Commission, it's pretty much related to new legislation. So you have to demonstrate every time you decide to have a new regulation, a new piece of legislation, that uh, which are the consequences of what you're doing. So it, in the context of the European Commission, the Better Regulation Guidelines is pretty much framed as a tool for um, the impact on legislation. And they use rather evaluation for the ex post or, or midterm assessment. There are other definitions uh, over there. But the idea is to have a structure process for um, uh, bearing in mind and then actually identify and then possibly measure the implications of some of the decisions of some of the decisions that um, uh, someone has to take in terms of investing resources and um, in doing actions that have an implication uh, very far in the future. Um, impact assessment of evaluation is linked, but it's another story than monitoring, for example. So we have been talking about key performance indicators, which are very useful tool for monitoring the performance of research infrastructure, but it's another story, it's something else. And it's different from audit, which is pretty much focused on financial reporting and compliance. So we are talking about an exercise of looking at the implications in, uh, uh, from different perspective, you can put it in an example perspective, midterm or ex post um, perspective of what you are going to do. So the idea is that this exercise requires a well identified plan. So a plan means that you have to decide beforehand who has to carry out an impact assessment exercise. Do you want to do it internally, externally, even when you outsource the exercise? Then you need to understand what kind of impact assessment do you want to carry out, what kind of competencies you have to invest internal resources in the dialogue with the external experts, because this takes time. When do you want to perform it? Do you want, are you going to do it ex ante, uh, in itinere, ex post? Are you doing the best practice would be to set in place the, the model for impact assessment and then using it as a strategic tool means that you routinely, every X years, you redo the analysis to see where you are. 
in what you were expected to deliver. What type of impacts are you going to track and to measure? Of course, there is not, as we have discussed this morning, uh, there is not a one-size-fits-all model. So it pretty much brings the idea of what is your core mission, what are you are going to deliver, how do you want to describe your impact, which are the focus of, of your socioeconomic impact, which kind of methods and tools are better fitting with what you want to uh, describe and measure, and especially which is a data collection plan that you have to put in place since the beginning. And then, of course, what do you want to do with this, with the results of impact assessment? You want to perform an impact assessment, and then how you are going to use these results? Are you going to use it just for external, for responding to the external request, or are you also trying to use it for internal uh, um, uh, purposes to, to trying to see whether you can maximize some of the impacts that can be more pressing for you? So let's go and, and see the data collection tools and the different possible impact areas. Now, there is a lot of discussion going on about which are the, which is the list of typical impacts, how we can describe the impacts of research infrastructure. It is a really endless story, but there is a certain, so if you really go and look at the very specific type of impacts of specific research infrastructure, you will see a great variety, but there is a certain consensus about the fact that there are some impact areas that are basically always there, and you have scientific impact, education impact, technological spillover and innovation, so impact on the firms, cultural and outreach, and science as a public good. And you have this classification which comes out in many of the reference um, um, work in the literature on this topic. So let's start and let's go one by one to see what we can say about how to put in place a data collection um, uh, system. Uh, scientific impact, first of all, the value on, on, of knowledge and uh, on how it, how it is disseminated. So the idea here is um, knowledge has a value in so far it, has, it is disseminated and someone is interested in knowing this new knowledge. So the way the knowledge is produced and then is disseminated is different in the different scientific communities. So there are some scientific community which relies a lot on publications. So there is, uh, so the indicators, the relevant indicators are the number of scientific publication with some uh, types of description of uh, types of journal, uh, types of publications, authors, um, are they from uh, um, scientists working in the research infrastructure or um, uh, scientists working outside the research infrastructure and using the results that, that are made public by the research infrastructure and which is the citations wave that comes from uh, this publication. In some other scientific domains, the knowledge is transmitted in, in rather different way or not mainly through the publication. So in, in some, some scientific domain like computer science, for example, you have more the habit of um, um, attending conferences, workshops, seminars. So in that case, the type of relevant indicators may be different or the details that you may want to have on that specific channel of materialization of impact is different. So the idea is to look at, at the uh, conference, at the important conferences that are organized, the workshops, the seminars, how many people is coming and from where they are coming. So the fact that someone is coming from very far away, you should be very interested in a topic if you are prepared to go from the other side of the globe to listen to the scientific community talking about a certain topic. So um, uh, in this case, the type of, um, the way of measuring the impact is different from what you would have in the case of publication. So in the case of publication, it's pretty much how much time do you spend to prepare a paper and how much time does other people spend in reading your papers and how many people read your papers and how many of them use it act actually for their further work. So the number of citation is the measure of how many people think that you have done a good job and they and the knowledge that you have produced has helped them in producing further knowledge. 
And in the case of events and workshops and conferences, the, the impact, the way you measure the impact is different. So you look at the people, uh, how many people attend the conferences and how much time do they spend and how much uh, money do they spend to come to the conference, which is a reflection. It should be at least equal to uh, what you get out of the conference. So you have invested your time today coming here and you have decided not to join other sessions. So um, in your mind, uh, the impact or the, the value of what you get from the session is equal to what you are losing now in doing something else. So this is the way you reflect the interest and the value of disseminating the, the knowledge. So if this is what you want to track, the tools that you need to put in place, and you have to think to this in advance, is a mandatory citation system. So we know that there are usually systems to mandatorily um, uh, require the citations for the people, for the authors using the papers, and also the data produced by research infrastructure. But this is not always done in a comprehensive way. It is not always closely scrutinized and checked. So if we take this seriously this exercise, we have to put in place a system where we are pretty sure that the, the tracking of publications and, and citations is a reliable measure of the way we produce knowledge and then we disseminate it to the scientific community. There are existing databases. You can see which are the databases or the streams of the type of archive and repositories that are more relevant in the case of your research infrastructure and to put in place a system to do this monitoring and this tracking systematically. Here are some examples, for example. Uh, this is coming from uh, a work that we have done for the CERN uh, in, the, in the context of a previous project. So this is a cumulative number of papers from LHC and LEP experiments compared. This was done by looking into the Inspire website with a system of tracking the names of the authors that, that, that were uh, publishing uh, on, on, the, on the repository. And, and this was done to um, forecast the, the wave of publications looking at the past publications in a given field. This is also a way of comparing across disciplines because depending on the disciplines, you have different uh, system of uh, the, the type of publication, the way the citations are made is different. The average numbers are of citations are of, all, of authors of the same paper is different, so you have to reflect also on the specificities of the scientific um, fields. And this is, again, a uh, number of sites per paper in the number of fields that you see that uh, there is quite high variation. So you have to reflect on the specificity of your scientific field. And then there is, I mean, the bi bi bibliometric and the scientometric um, uh, science is also there to, to, uh, to help. Another type of scientific impact is the production of data and, and ICT and software. And here again, there is the idea of tracking the number of users, the number of downloads, the, the data contact that is used. And um, the idea is looking with the user surveys, trying to track the downloads and trying to understand in which way, basically in terms of time saving, uh, how the, the life of the scientists is made easier thanks to the availability of these tools. Education impact, there are people spending time in research infrastructure, gaining skills and competencies, going out on the market and selling their competences and gain, gaining wage premium, reflecting the value that uh, firms attach to um, what they have learned. Uh, well, you have to have a system, a tracking system of, of students. And you may want to have a system of surveys, systematic surveys, going back to the people that have spent some time in your place and asking how this has changed your career, what kind of um, wage level do you have as compared to uh, other colleagues. And possibly, this is the most challenging aspect, uh, running systematic survey to control groups. So with 
people that did not spend time in a research infrastructure and see which is the difference in their, um, in their wage um, trajectory. These, of course, uh, raise problems in terms of ethics and data protection management. So you have, this is something you cannot do like this uh, from scratch. You have to think in advance on how to put in place a system to do it in a reliable way to get very good data. So here, you s I have to rush. Technological spillover and innovation, we have uh, already uh, talked about. There are different channels and by, through which you can, get, uh, you can get data. You can have systematic surveys, again, to the companies. Um, you need to track uh, startups and spin-offs. So there is this program of the NASA, which is a very advanced way to track and report uh, and demonstrate also the spin-off effect of the NASA. Uh, there are ways to uh, take objective data from the uh, database of balance sheets to, to see the differences between companies um, in the procurement um, channel of some uh, research infrastructure with uh, comparing with pairs. And then the, the point of tracking patents. So again, with the publications, you have patents. You can track patents. You can track the citations of the patents. And this is also relevant information. Cultural and outreach, you have to track physical and virtual visitors. You have to take into account that every time you organize something, it's you are spreading the word of what you are doing. So you are reaching out people and citizens. Um, you have the social media. We are now in this moment webcasted, so there are people looking at us. Hello there. And so this is another way to um, to have to have a higher impact. But you have to know how many people are possibly watching this video, and then you need to have proper tools. So you need to have web analytics. You need to have media tracking systems to be prepared when someone will ask you, so uh, what kind of cultural and out, outside outreach did you do? And then science as a public good, as we have um, heard before, if you want to look at the preferences of taxpayers about spending public money uh, on big science, there is the channel of, of um, asking, asking the willingness to pay of the citizens for investing in big science and on particular science objects. So this can be well done, but you need surveys and you need to design and carry it out in a proper way in order to be scientifically sound and reliable. So I think I'm almost in time. Uh, this is some list of references and thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sylvia. Is there, are there any questions for Sylvia while we're getting the next uh, speaker set up to talk? Yep. Can you distribute the microphone for the people not in the room? Uh, thank you for the presentation because I work in something similar. But then the question, how, once you have collected all this data and information, first it takes time to analyze to get the sense and meaning and then the difficulties we have is how to enter into the decision-making process because I mean, you need to have also a culture of accepting these indicators to elaborate it, to reflect on it because it can be also too, too simple to say this uh, uh, part got more views on YouTube, the other one less, uh, so this is successful and we invest more in this. I mean, really simplify to provoke a bit the, uh, your reaction, but how to feed the decision-making process? The decision-making process is, is the decision-making process outside the research infrastructure, but also inside the research infrastructure. So what I wanted to stress is that impact assessment is useful not only vis-a-vis -vis the external uh, uh, the, the funding agencies or the stakeholders, but also as an internal management system. So, of course, once you decide that you go and track some indicators, some data, you need to know how to use them for your purposes. So let's, for example, look at the educational impact. Once you know that there are the students and the, uh, the, uh, the PhD coming in your place uh, comes uh, specifically from, uh, or especially from one specific field, and you discover that 
the wage premium is higher for those going in certain industries or acquiring some specific type of skills and competencies, you can understand that you are better off in developing that specific know-how other than others. So, for example, you can decide to have a program for recruiting students in that specific scientific areas, for example. So I think that um, having an internal reflection on how to, um, to maximize the impact is, is a good way to use this kind of exercise, not, not necessarily, not only because someone is asking you what you are doing for the society, but also because it's something, it's a learning process for, for the research infrastructure itself. Of course, you need to have a, a plan in your mind. You need to be prepared to have this kind of conversation with the people working with you. You need to engage people, as, as we have heard from, from the CERN. And you need to convince also people that it's good to collect and to do the, the, uh, to do the effort to invest time to collect this type of data, because it's useful for what you're doing. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to well, we have a session, I think, at the end where we can possibly have a broader discussion around any of these points. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Lynn Kretschmar from uh, Vienna University of Economics. Um, Lynn's currently completing a doctorate at uh, the Institute for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Um, and she's looking into uh, the valorization potential of technologies involved in manufacturing process of superconducting materials. Uh, and today she's going to talk to us about leverage, leveraging the economic potential of accelerator technologies. We're still looking for your presentation. Figuring out something because I changed a little bit the presentation and I think it should be, it's not this one, there is the slide, but you can just leave it out, just delete it and then it's fine if you delete the slide. No, no, that's not the point. I think that works with his, this one. No, no, this no? one comes with this piece. Ah, okay. Ah, it's okay, okay. So, so which one? This. Ah, okay, perfect. Okay, uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I would like to talk a little bit more about a hands-on approach on how to identify innovative application fields for the research that is being done, for example, at CERN. So since there was already an introduction, uh, I'm not gonna go into detail here, but I think an important part is that I'm part of the Easy Train um, project. We are 15 ESRs, and uh, since I have a business background, I'm responsible for the evaluation of the market potential of the technologies that are involved in building the FCC. And uh, I think, I think it has been talked about a lot by other speakers yesterday and already today, how important it is to kind of connect um, business or indust industry and, and science, because uh, if you have scientific advancements that you work on uh, and you put it into industry, you can actually reduce the manufacturing costs to, to build, for example, the FCC. As Michael yesterday talked about, especially the manufacturing costs for the magnets are very high, and we, of course, want to have them as low as possible. So in order to do that, we need to go to industry and, and find application fields for the research. Um, and how do we do that? Usually, a lot of uh, application fields are, are found by accident. For example, Teflon, I'm sure you know the Teflon example. It was uh, found uh, by accident, but we try at our university, we try to um, get, have a more systematic approach to, to finding application fields, and actually my supervisor and a colleague of his um, developed a method which is called technology competence leveraging which is a systematic approach to identify and evaluate innovative application fields for existing technologies. It's a four-step process. I'm going to go in, not into detail here because I don't have the time, but um, the first step is to identify the benefits of a technology that you have at hand. Um, the second step to find uh, or to search for new application fields, for example, by talking to customers, by talking to experts, and uh, having analogous markets that you could have a look at. Um, and the third step is the assessment of the ideas based on strategic fit and, and their relevant uh, ben, um, benefit relevance. Um, fourth step is the determination of the valorization strategies. That means uh, try to find out how, to, how is the value created, for whom is the value created. 
And for our project, for the Easy Train project, we did the TCL method for superconducting uh, magnets as well as the manufacturing chain of superconducting magnets. And I will go shortly over the results that we found. So in order to find application fields for manufacturing steps in the production of the magnet, first of all, you of course have to know what the manufacturing process is, which is not as easy for us to understand as a, coming from a business background. I don't, I'm not an expert in, in superconducting magnets, so we had to kind of figure out how the um, process is being done. And um, of, this, of this process that you can see, we figured out that three steps are very valuable or can be very valuable for, for, the, for industry. That is the production of the superconducting Rutherford cable, the thermal treatment, which is done by an, uh, with an oven, and the vacuum impregnation uh, with epoxy. And of these three manufacturing steps, we try to identify a couple of application fields where you could use these technologies, these processes in industry. And you can find a list of, uh, of um, application fields that we found out uh, during, our pro um, yeah, during our project. And you can also see down in the, uh, the chart their benefit relevance and their strategic fit. So they're, so they're mapped on that. And as you can see here, uh, one of uh, very interesting or very poten high potential um, application fields is scrap metal recycling. Um, so the, the oven that is used in order to, to treat the, um, the superconducting magnet could also be used in the uh, scrap metal recycling industry. And we did a, uh, did a detailed market analysis. Actually, you can also find the poster uh, today uh, where it's more in detail explained what we actually did at uh, Vienna University um, in the Klimt room. So you can feel free to, to come and join us there. And we did a detailed analysis of the scrap metal uh, recycling industry and we, ma we made an overview over the supply chain and we spoke to the key players. We identified them and spoke to the key players and checked, okay, so how is this important? Is this an important technology for you or do you need uh, other aspects that have to be realized first? Um, and we also mapped the industry technology fit. So what you can see here is the, um, the dimensions of the oven, so how precise the, the heating is, how, how high the speed of the heating is, and how relevant it is for different industry, industries. For example, you can see that argon, which is used as a protective gas in, in the oven in order to protect, uh, uh, protect the materials is very important in the precious metal industry because it diminishes the shrinkage of the materials, which of course for precious metals is very important. Um, this, this was the one project that we did, and the second project that we did was, uh, as I said, for specifically the magnet, not the manufacturing process, but the magnet itself. And for that, we first identified the core benefits, and we did actually conduct a hackathon at CERN in 2017, where students of different study fields came to CERN and, and developed ideas of application fields for the superconducting magnet and worked on their ideas. And you can see also the different kind of ideas mapped based on their benefit relevance and strategic fit. And one of the most promising technologies or uh, application fields that we found was, is the fruit sorting, actually. So because uh, the, the magnet has a, has a, is generating a strong electromagnetic field, you can actually uh, tell the ripeness and the quality of the fruit by, by, um, by using the NMR-based system. And you can do that in a very non-destructive way, which, uh, as you can see here, when you look at the competitors in the fruit sorting market, is actually a niche, because mostly the technologies that you can see mapped there have either a high invasiveness or a low precision. And NMR actually gives you the possibility to don't destroy the fruit, but also be very precise in estimating the quality of the fruit. Um, so we talked to, to a lot of industry experts and found also out that um, there is a technology adaption need uh, if we want to use the technology, like if, it's, if it should fit perfectly to the fruit sorting needs, then particularly the speed has to be increased because as of now it's a pretty uh, lengthy process to evaluate the quality of each fruit. So there has to be some work done in order to increase the speed, for example. We also had a look at the supply chain and the potential, and I think 
uh, what was very interesting when we, when we analyzed the application field is that there is actually another application field that we didn't think of in the food industry, which uh, is the chick culling. I don't know whether you're familiar with this uh, topic, but there are, 45, <laughs> there are 45 million chicks killed, male chicks killed in Germany each year. Um, and the, because they are unprofitable and there is no need of them, so they, have, they cannot lay eggs. So the industry is in need to determine the sex of, of the chicks very early on, like uh, in the egg already. And it's actually, we're, we're still validating that, but we, we think that you, NMR systems could actually determine the size of the chromosomes and therefore find out what sex the, uh, the, the, the chick in the egg has. So this is, uh, I think, a very nice, interesting field that should be looked in further. Um, what will we do next? So we did the superconducting magnets and the superconducting magnet manufacturing process. And, and in October this year, we would like to go on and find application fields for um, the radio frequency cavities as well as their manufacturing process. Uh, and uh, next year, we will probably ha hold another hackathon, but this is still in the planning. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, you can come to me and we can discuss. It's a very interesting aspect. Um, I think, just one more slide, uh, the things that I learned during uh, the TCL method and I think the things that you should take away from, from my presentation is that you should not only consider the final product, so not only the magnet but also the manufacturing chain and the different steps. There is so much market potential in, in the different steps and the technologies and the processes that you should not like, um, forget about that and have a look at them as well. I think another important key thing that I learned is that you, should, uh, you also have to anticipate dead ends and unexpected turns because sometimes in the beginning you uh, think that the application field is very valuable, very important, but in the end it turns out if you talk to an expert it doesn't really work. So it's a very iterative process and you have to, you have to anticipate that. And I think the last part which is a very important for me with a business background is that we have to kind of work together because I don't have the expert knowledge that you have. So I need to know about the technologies. I have to know uh, about the benefits and in order to estimate the validity or to validate whether the, um, the applica application fields are good or not, I need your knowledge. So it's, it's nice to have like an exchange of knowledge and I think it's very important for, um, for the method. Yeah. That's it. Thank you so much. So, thanks, thanks very much, Lynn, for keeping on time. So I didn't even get to my green card. That's fantastic. Well done. <laughs> um, I think very interesting insights there at the end. I think this process, in parallel to the, the, the socioeconomic impact assessments we were talking about earlier, offers that insight into you have to be aware of all the different types of possible impacts mm -hmm. or applications, uh, as you call them. Um, are there any questions at this stage for Lynn? Yeah. I'm a bit surprised that you did not identify one of the very few existing applications of superconducting magnets in industry, which is the extraction of uh, uh, iron-based impurities into uh, kaolin, and which is a condition to make uh, real China. Okay. Um, I, I mean, we, we mostly focused on, on in, uh, new application fields, so not, not having like a market analysis of what's existing because we wanted to go further. And it is existing at the prototype level, but it is, it is something which may, may well develop. Yeah. For the next hackathon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, thanks for the presentation. I wanted to ask if on the methodological level uh, concerning the selection of new potential application, it's uh, all qualitative based uh, on expert evaluations or do you have also some... Can you repeat please? I can't really hear much on that. Uh, my why. question is uh, if the selection of new application is just based on expert consultation or if you also apply some ah, okay. quantitative tools or no, there are methods yeah. for front offer on text mining of patents or if you do something like that or it's just yeah. so, quantitative. Uh, there are three aspects that we consider. It's first of all the benefit relevance. So how relevant is this technology to, to serve a specific need? 
So we, we calculate that. Then we have the strategic fit. So the fit, does it fit to, if you have the oven producer, for example, does the new technology, the new application field kind of fit to the strategy of the company? Does that also fit? Is this what we're calculating? And then, of course, how often it was uh, named by, by experts that say that's a very relevant aspect. These are the three aspects that we choose them on. Any other questions at this stage? Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, the fourth speaker, sorry, is uh, gonna talk about rethinking the public value of science. So, uh, Maria Lurerio from University of Santiago de Compostela, uh, who's uh, been working in the States, amongst other things. Uh, her fields of specialization are agricultural economics, environmental economics, and health economics. And I'll let you talk. Thank you so much uh, for, for inviting me. So thank you to CERN uh, for, for having me here. And thank you to, for Johannes to make it possible. Uh, when they gave me the title of this talk, the truth is that I thought, well, what should I be talking about at the, la at the last uh, session or one of the la latest sessions in the day? So I will be talking about the public value of science, hopefully doing it in a big innovative way as the title requested, rethinking the public value of science. It's a bit challenging to do so, but uh, I'll try to do my best. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about science as a public good, but given the large amount of um, information we already received about this point, I'm gonna go brief over that. I'm gonna be talking also how to value, how to approach public goods. I'm going to present you just a very uh, basic example about public perceptions about CERN, looking at uh, social media, and finally some suggestions and thoughts for ways forward on how to look at public goods. Of course, we already know and we have learned this morning, we have heard this morning, the importance uh, for policy making uh, in terms of showing the utility of science, the social utility of science. And that's a crucial point. And more and more so, our governments feel scrutinized about showing the benefits of our science and science projects. Uh, we have seen also during the morning and also later uh, today uh, how cost-benefit analysis can help us guide in this decision making. And this is very challenging already to do a cost-benefit analysis, and particularly as they do here to look at the social perspective of science. And what I'm going to be talking about is about the fact that, public, uh, that science is not only a public good, but also a global public good. And making it global and thinking on a global perspective makes, more, makes valuation much more complex. So we are thinking about valuing goods that are really broad, general, immense in its nature, as it should be. Furthermore, this should be initially provided at no cost. So of course, at times, the cost-benefit analysis in the short-term projects may not be as positive as desirable because we are looking at a public good. If we were looking at a private good, certainly things would be different. But what I'm going to be looking at is more about the impact of, of, of this need for, for broadening our perspective when we look at public goods, when we look at, in particular, global public goods, and based on the fact that this morning insisted considerably on the fact that we have to open our science. So we're looking at open science projects and so on and so forth. As it has been indicated by my uh, previous colleagues, of course, we look at computing the total value of a particular good or a particular project. And that implies a significant value in, the, in terms of use, in terms of demand. This is great for, for economists. Economists usually uh, have a lot of tools in order to measure demand. So use values are very well established in the literature. So is the case of non-use values, for, particularly for environmental economics, for public goods related to the environment, but not so much about science contributions. And the, non and the public good nature implies that science has a very broad perspective of values to be considered. One of them, which is rather important in my opinion, is the option value. You may be investigating today in your labs about something and you don't see an application, but then, as my earlier colleagues show, there's a great industrial application for this. So there is a very significant option value in many things we do. Something that may not be valuable today at all may have a great value in the future. 
So there is a considerable thought that we should be putting into our research projects in order to look at the potential option value with option theory and so on and so forth. There is also the bequest value, the wish that some of us have to transmit knowledge to the next generations in an altruistic way, in an altruistic manner, without you know, uh, uh, requesting anything as exchange. Or the assistance value, the preferences that we indicated this morning that individuals have in Europe just to support certain research lines just because, because they want to have a public institution that investigates in this field of research. So all in all justifies the fact that, as you may understand, to compute the total economic value of a scientific project is a very significant and challenging task, very complex task. And we have spoken about the different type of values uh, that may be assessed. But we have not talked much about risk and uncertainty, that's an additional issue that complicates matters into, into, into hand. I'm not going to be talking about that, but we have to acknowledge that, of course, as we have indicated here, we, we uh, someone pointed out in the morning, economists may be like weather forecasts <laughs> or uh, physics looking at the weather. Yeah, there are many models that predict weather, and some do better than others at 30, 40, or imagine to predict the weather at 50 years' time. Like we have to at times come up with an estimate of cost benefit analysis for a 50 year project, right? And also, time preferences matter, as indicated earlier. So, how to value public goods? How we should go into this, and how we should have this broader perspective that may help us to bring up more information to the table? The issue at hand is clear, there are no market prices, but this doesn't imply that there are no values, that there is no importance on what we do, even if, if we don't do anything that has a commercial immediate value or use value. So the, uh, we rely on citizens' valuations in order to assess public goods. So, and the question that uh, has been already assessed uh, uh, when this morning and presented is how much are you willing to pay for this type of research, right? This is the typical uh, continuum evaluation question in which citizens show their preferences, their stated preferences about a particular uh, research project. And this is being done traditionally as it has been presented in a referenda type of question. In, in economics, there is also a, great, a history on how we do things and why. And the fact that we use usually open and referenda type of questions implies that we put the citizen in a perspective in, we, in which he or she has to choose and vote as in a real life referendum to make a scenario in a survey which is kind of similar or parallel to what could be a political referendum in their countries. Will you vote or will you pay more money or this amount of taxes to support CERN, for example? So, uh, as it turns out, of course, stakeholder participation and perceptions are crucial in order to determine whether or not you are going to be willing to support particular research agendas. And this is, has been my latest work on understanding social preferences uh, through a direct approach. Direct approach means that we go to the, to the individuals and we collect from them their values, their preferences and their assessments. And this is what has been done in the morning in the continuum evaluation exercise that presented uh, Professor Massimo. Well, uh, there is this approach and other approaches also based on indirect, uh, um, uh, indirect um, collection of data that basically what we do is to try to look uh, for uh, science in the market that indicates the values of, uh, um, of the good and service that we are valuing at hand. When we are doing s surveys, you may think, oh, it's so simple to do a survey. Oh, no way. It's very complex to do a survey. It's kind of very difficult to do a survey, a good survey. A good survey may suffer uh, for a different type of biases. One of them, for instance, is hypothetical bias. When presented with a question, you may think this is a hypothetical question. So the best answer to a hypothetical question is an hypothetical response. Would you be willing to pay? Oh, I, I may be willing to pay. All hypothetical, which is not what you really want. What you really want is a real answer to an, in fact, uh, actual scenario that may happen. There are many other type of biases that may occur as well. In, in spite of the fact that surveys usually are pre-test and rerun several times until we get to this magical uh, survey instrument. Another one is social desirability bias. It may happen that you feel bad about telling people or telling the researcher that you are not willing to support CERN because you have other commitments. 
and because you feel bad, you don't feel like you are the greatest citizens on the earth, you decide to say yes. That's called yeah saying as well. Right? You say yeah, but it's not a real, truth, truthful, honest response. So when we keep in mind to consider and to analyze real truth, uh, truth telling responses, uh, we run into some problems at times when, correct, when conducting surveys. That's why at times we have to do some sort of corrections in terms of, for instance, the sign or uh, changing the order of questions that may also affect the output or uh, just to, to, to do some other assessments. So what I'm going to tell you today is a little a short approximation. We have them quickly. Uh, the fact that we can use, at times, uh, big data when available in order to assess public goods, or at least perceptions toward public goods. There is a great paper published in Science by Aina and Evin that tell us that uh, nowadays, in this new uh, 21st century, we are very lucky, the economy is working on, on environmental evaluation or uh, cultural goods and so on and so forth. And the reason is because we have plenty of open source data available to us that was not available in the past. And this huge amount of data uh, uh, creates a great research environment to ask questions that we, we couldn't ask before or we couldn't address before in the way we can do now. So um, I'm going to show you now how we are going to be using this type of different data sets, in particular one that we gather in social media in, uh, to reveal preferences and, con and, and concerns about, for instance, a particular uh, research uh, 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 are I, um, or a large infrastructure such as CERN. So, how we did this? We are uh, using, in an experimental way, social media, and please take it as an experimental way. And, and we do this in order to understand right away uh, what are the uh, concerns and preferences of, uh, obtained in unsolicited ways. So, the survey uh, is based on solicited opinions. But however, here we are analyzing unsolicited opinions. That means opinions that are coming from individuals at any moment, at any time, with any particular uh, impression you, or any particular uh, push you may give them, right? And there are nowadays plenty of open data in terms of social media. For instance, Twitter, Facebook, and you, uh, these two both have uh, easy APIs available from which it's possible to download the data and to do some preliminary analysis rather quick. And this is what I have done for you today, is to, to show you that there are possibilities out there uh, that may help us in order to value this global dimension of public goods. But uh, let me give you a word of caution. Uh, social data is not perfect either. To start with, uh, we have to be concerned about authentication of users to be sure that the users are real individuals, agents, private or public, but real, they are not goods. And also to be aware that even though when you do the data cleaning and you make sure that you have a real use, uh, sample of users, you are looking at a sample that may be biased. That means that they don't, do not represent fully the general population of a particular country, right? So you have to be aware of all that before you go into further analysis. So yet yeah, this is a quick example I prepared for you in order to show you uh, how people um, uh, or what can we learn from social media that may help us to integrate this knowledge into, for instance, the previous continuum evaluation study that was presented. Right? So we collected data from the first two weeks of uh, June and uh, June 2019 from these ac accounts: the CERN account, the Atlas Experiment account, the LHC News, the CERN LHC. LHC Life account, Alice Experiment, and CMS Experiment. We use only, I have to admit it as, as a shortcoming, uh, the English account, right? Uh, although in the English account there is a very large an amount of users and there are users all over the world as well. And just uh, uh, for, for us to understand what's happening, what people have in mind, how are they expressing sentiments, and how these sentiments can be translated into, into indexes, we use some tools based on uh, uh, sentiment analysis. Basically, the idea of sentiment analysis is to retrieve, in fact, from unsolicited opinions, a particular thought or impression that an agent may have, that a user may have, or express. So this is based on what is called natural language processing, and basically is a, a field uh, from the computer science that is uh, developing immensely right now because it can have a lot of applications as well, not on, uh, 
from linguistics, economics, cultural sciences, and so on and so forth. And the idea is the following. The idea is that you collect all these uh, databases of, of tweets, of tweets coming from these accounts that I told you. And basically what you do is like a process of uh, cleaning and, um, um, and organizing in the sense that each of the, uh, of the sentences becomes a vector. This vector is uh, clean in the sense that, for instance, uh, prepositions may be eliminated or not, depending on the wishes of the researcher, but usually pre propositions are eliminated. And so you have a, a, a vector of nouns and verbs and adjectives. And uh, then what you can do is, uh, of course, do very basic um, uh, in inf information gathering and uh, very, basic visual very basic visualization tools and keep it in a very um, illustrative manner or else you can do some numerical, uh, numerical uh, indexes. For instance, here, if I want to retrieve, what are people talking about when they talk in, this, in the accounts that are related to CERN? Well, they are talking basically, the English-speaking users, they are talking basically about the LHC project, and they are talking about time and will, and there is a place, time will tell, like this uh, option value, time will tell, right? Or uh, other items that reflect certain hope about the future of, of the research lines that are uh, going on right now. In terms of sentiments, we can also retrieve sentiments. Is this a positive or negative word? And uh, what sentiments are, can be anticipated? Most of the sentiments are positive and they are related to, the first one is trust, trust on the institution. The second one is anticipation, looking forward for something to happen. Surprise and joy. In terms of the Spanish, uh, the Spanish users, what do the Spanish users talk about? Well, the Spanish users talk about the fact that CERN is in apuesta, bits for código abierto, open code, Microsoft software, right? So this is basically what the Spanish community is talking about. They are talking about the fact that CERN is going, to liberate, is going to liberate us from paying the fees for Microsoft. This is true, in fact. Yeah? <laughs> and these are different perceptions on the, on, uh, on, on the society right now. And uh, although, of course, uh, please keep it like a very uh, basic analysis, it reveals some sort of information. For the Spaniards uh, or the Spanish-speaking community, anticipation is the crucial element as well, trust and joy as well. So in summary, uh, you can not only provide these uh, cloud words and some uh, um, descriptive analysis, but you can go a bit far, uh, further and try to generate indexes. Indexes that show, for instance, happiness. Happiness with respect to institution or the programs of research that a particular institution carries out. And there was a paper uh, uh, Developed uh, published in 2016 that developed the hedonometer tool. The hedonometer tool, there is a person here, of professor of philosophy, who will probably tell us much better that the hedonism tries to look uh, and understand happiness, right? Uh, the hedonometer tool, what allows us is to generate an index from one to nine, one when you are quite concerned about a topic or you express a sad, yeah, a sad impression in nine when you are very happy. And it tells you in a systematic way how the conversation can be uh, indexed according to, to this scale. There is a large process behind the, I have one minute, behind the hedonometer, but the idea is that uh, words uh, are related with a particular sentiment, right? So for instance, laughter is a very positive word and has been ranked with 8.5. And where this ranking is coming from, the ranking has been generated by uh, a pool of uh, a, uh, people around the world uh, by the Amazon MTurk uh, uh, tool. So we have, for instance, laughter with 8.5, and on the opposite scale, we have terrorism with a 1.3, which shows a very negative concern or a very negative feeling about terrorist attacks. So on average, understanding that the Average is 4.5, the linear average. What the, uh, what the hedonometer results indicate? 
Well, they indicate that they are part uh, particularly happy with, with the CERN uh, in, or the impression that they describe about CERN. If I, am going to, if I was going to ask them how happy are you from one to nine, they will tell me numerically 5.5, the Spanish-speaking community, and 5.3, the, the English-speaking one. In summary, what I want to tell you, I just presented this in an illustrative way. Please don't take it right now. It's not a concluded case study. It's just only to open the floor for debate, thoughts, ideas, and so on and so forth, and to use also, and to be aware that this social media has a lot of potential, has a lot of information, and we can also retrofit and uh, uh, generate uh, a particular um, topics that may, may come back to us. For instance, in the, in the Spanish community, we saw the importance of the licensing of Microsoft and, and the making us free of the Microsoft license, but actually, this has been also picked by a very prestigious newspaper and was in the press. So this an idea that, you know, there are some um, inter interesting connections between what social media can do for us and what we ca how we can use social media in order to position ourselves for the general public. Mm, there are many more venues for the future, in summary, that I could tell you about, but uh, my impression is that uh, perceptions are extremely important. Nowadays are more important than ever. There are multiple uses, and the opportunity cost of, of resources is very significant. And therefore, uh, it's very interesting to be able to use social media in order to understand trends, perceptions, impressions, and so on and so forth that may help us immediately to get an assessment. And just to conclude, maybe also we may also think not only on cost-benefit, but additional tools such as multi-criteria analysis and so on and so forth that may contain a broader social dimension of public goods. And with that, I conclude. Thank you. Hey, thanks, for, thanks very much. I mean, I think one of the, the impact channels we're trying to measure is outreach and, and, uh, and, and how science and the research infrastructures are changing perceptions. I think when we visited CERN, we were told that uh, the, the most searched thing on YouTube for CERN was about black holes and, and, and uh, yeah. devil worship or something like that. So CERN had, uh, has also those sorts of uh, things to tackle true. sometimes. So seeing that people are happy with CERN is good <laughs> to see. Um, are there any questions at this stage for, for Maria? Yep, one at the back there. Hello, thanks for a very interesting talk. And this is a very trivial question, but can you also um, sort emojis as they're such a big component of Twitter sentiment? Yes, you can. There are some particular packages that deal with emojis, in fact. I haven't done it here. I use only language, yeah, text. But yes, it can be done. And in fact, it should be done to, do, to have a broader comprehensive work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Yeah, there's another yeah. one. There. Okay, uh, one more short question because I'm getting signs that we have to yeah. keep. No, I mean, this is really good. Sorry, thank you. And, and the, the idea of using big data um, to quantify these kind of interactions I think is really promising. Um, but if I was a political decision maker, I would want to know how much this is, this is worth. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. You know, because, because there are a lot of things that engage people in social media, cat videos and stuff, yeah. and scientific investment. I, I yeah. would be afraid that if you ranked CERN against other social media sites, it didn't show up as positively as, as we would hope it would. It is true. Uh, this is correct. Uh, yes, um, you are right on that. How do you measure this into economic terms? Uh, actually, this, uh, this hedonometer and uh, this result can be translated uh, into, uh, I could, for instance, then and having these two indexes, 5.3 versus 5.7, I could try to figure out what amount of money will make you different between both, for instance, right? This would be a way. But uh, another way is that um, uh, how this translates into economics, uh, you can, uh, after you have this data set, you can do a, a much more elaborated analysis looking at how people, you know, females, male, where they are, what they talk about, and even you can target information, you can make things happen, and uh, you can do a very interesting analysis. Okay, thanks very much. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave questions for the last session. Um, so, last but not, thank you very much, Maria. Uh, last but not least, we have uh, Ricardo Crescenzi from the London School of Economics, uh, professor uh, in uh, economic geography. I've, had the pleasure to read quite a few of his 
articles in the past. Uh, and Ricardo will talk today about the drivers of innovative collaborations and the role of public policies. So thank you very much. Uh, conscious of time, uh, I will try to be uh, short, sharp, and succinct. Uh, that is always dangerous as a start. Uh, so um, my presentation will focus on the local impact of uh, research and development, innovation, uh, investments. So I will try to focus on a very particular aspect of the many issues that uh, have been covered uh, throughout the day. Um, so my uh, talk will uh, revolve around three key points. The first is that when we uh, try to assess local impacts, uh, we really need to reflect on how research and development, how big investments in innovation impact the local environment. So I will try to discuss with you the link uh, between uh, investing in innovation and generating innovation at the regional level, generating innovation in the surrounding local subnational environment. And I will discuss how very often in the European experience what is missing is collaboration, is the link between uh, large research centers, large innovation infrastructure and their surrounding environment. Okay, this is what we often call uh, cathedrals in the desert. We have like big infrastructure that have very limited connection with the surrounding environment and with firms uh, in, the local, in, in the local area. Uh, and, and finally, I will discuss an example where policymakers have put subsidies on the table to facilitate this type of links. So they have subsidized firms and research centers to work together and say, okay, if you submit this project together, I, I will give you funding. And I will discuss with you what are the evidence that we find when we try and assess uh, this type of uh, uh, experiments. So regional innovation and R&D investments. Basically, the key point here, here, what you can see is the estimation of what we call a knowledge production function. So it's a production function is a sort of like recipe where as an output you have patents generated by regions and as an input you have human capital and research uh, 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 research and development investments, okay? So you have an input, the human capital, the people working to generate new ideas and the investments, and as an output, it's a very crude measure, like the patents that are generated as a result at the regional level. And this is a non-parametric estimation, so we can see how the link between investments in research and development in this panel and the uh, um, innovation output measured by, by patents changes for different levels of R&D intensity. So what basically uh, we can see is that for low levels of uh, uh, R&D investments, the returns to these investments in terms of patents is relatively low. So even if, if I have a region where like innovation investments are relatively low, investing more gives relatively low returns initially. Only after a certain threshold, that is, if you remember the Lisbon agenda by the European uh, Commission, below, uh, after, when we pass uh, the 2-3% two, two, threshold, then the returns to these investments start becoming higher. So this tells us that where we uh, place research infrastructure matters a lot for the regional returns to these investments. The link between uh, uh, human capital, so the people uh, working, the people that have the capability to contribute to regional innovation and output is much more linear. So these are, this is the share of people with tertiary education, and we can see that the returns to human capital investments uh, are much more linear uh, um, in terms of returns, uh, in terms of additional uh, regional innovation. However, like the most interesting insight when we study how Europe generates innovation is the link between the two, is the link between human capital and R&D that we can see here. So here we have the returns to R&D investments in terms of patents. Here we have the returns in terms of human capital and at the intersection we can read the interaction between R&D and human capital. And we can clearly see, I don't know where uh, the pointer is, but uh, you can see at the top margin over there that where returns to innovation investments are maximized is where there is also a high level of human capital present in the region. So the idea is that for investments in innovation to generate local returns, you need to have in place complementary supportive 
local conditions uh, in terms of human capital endowment, so as to avoid this cathedral in the desert type of effect. And we were able to measure this by looking at the interaction between R&D investments and uh, local R&D investments and local human capital. So the link between uh, investing in innovation and generating innovation at the regional level is far from linear, is shaped by complex uh, interactions between other regional factors. So what is it that explains the diversity of returns from uh, innovation investments in different regions of Europe? And so that, the, my argument is that there is a missing link, this largely collaboration. If we think about science, if we think about the generation of innovation today, we see that these are uh, patents uh, filed in the UK Patent Office between 1978 and 2007. And uh, these are the different sectors, the different technological classes uh, in which patents can be classified. And here we can see the share of patents that are co-invented. This, I mean, is certainly not new to this type of audience, but if we think about science, we can see that uh, when we approach uh, 2007, 2008, uh, in, in certain technological fields like pharmaceutical or biotechnology, almost 100% of patented patents are co-invented. So uh, uh, science, the generation of innovation, is a collaborative effort. You need a team. And this is clearly visible here when we can see uh, that uh, in, 19, in, the, in the 1980s, uh, having inventors working alone, the lone scientist was the norm, uh, and today the, the lone inventor is disappearing and teams are, are the norm. So when policymakers think about science, they think about science as a collaborative effort, it's about people working together. So the key point that um, uh, policymakers took from that is, okay, so if collaboration is an important part of innovation, if we want to become more innovative, then we need to foster clusters. We need to foster agglomeration so that it's easier for people to meet and work together and collaborate. So if we have big uh, infrastructure, research infrastructural investments, then a good idea might be to build a cluster around them to facilitate firms or facilitate universities to co-locate with these centers to facilitate uh, the ability to generate collaborations and therefore making domestic firms and research centers more innovative. However, what the, 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 the recurrent narrative about these problems has overlooked is the fact that for people to collaborate, they need other proximities to be in place. So the fact that we are in this room together is not necessarily something that will shape our collaboration in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, innovative uh, endeavors. We will need to speak the same language, for example, or we will need a number of other proximities that can shape the probability of us collaborating. So the simple fact of being co-located is not necessarily something that will foster our collaboration, precisely because for collaboration to happen, we need to take into account other factors. And what we did is to explore uh, these other factors, to get a sense of what these other factors might be. And to do this, we looked into all patents filed at the UK uh, PTO and looked at the relationships between inventors to try and see what was the importance of the relative distance between the inventors versus other factors, versus their organizational proximity, so belonging to the same type of organization, the fact that I am an academic might give me intrinsically different incentives as opposed to an inventor that works for a private firm. Uh, institutional, where uh, I am actually located, what type of, um, of, or, of organization, so do we belong to the same organization or not? Is it easier for people to collaborate within CERN or if they are part of CERN and uh, another organization? So to what extent uh, uh, this type of belonging to every, every, having different affiliations shapes our probability of collaborating? And of course, there are also uh, matters of cognitive proximity, to what extent our field of specialization also has an impact in our ability to exchange ideas, to work together, as well as social proximity. So we looked at the social network, at the probability of people, uh, uh, what is the probability of me working with someone else, given that we had a previous co-inventor in common. So what is the probability of closing uh, uh, a, a triad, for example, versus the, the, the distance uh, in, the, in the social network? 
And we also looked at ethnic proximity, to what extent then these collaborations are instead shaped by uh, ethnic um, networks. Uh, and there is a large literature in the US uh, on this. So we try to compare the importance of these different factors on the probability to collaborate and on the intensity of the collaboration between individuals. To try and disentangle by building a suitable counterfactual what is the additional uh, impact of these different proximities and ultimately if geographical proximity matters more than these other proximities or not or how do they complement each other. So the key result is that physical proximity has become more important over time, not less important. So notwithstanding the claim of the depth of distance, the, the explosion of the uh, use of information and communication technologies, working together in the same uh, infrastructure, in the same environment, uh, has become more important, not less important over time. But this, um, the, 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 the role of physical proximity is mediated by organizational and cultural factors. We do need to be part of the same organizational structure to be able to collaborate. So it is true that being co-located helps, but only as far as we are uh, uh, supported by um, a, an adequate organizational arrangement that makes this collaboration possible. However, if we look at multiple inventors, so people that, that, that patent multiple times, and here we are looking at the research stars uh, of, of, of the UK system, then geographic proximity is much less important. So if I am a star, I can really be located uh, uh, everywhere uh, I want. Uh, so that I can basically leverage my popularity in order to keep collaborating with whomever I want without the need of uh, the, physical, the presence of, of physical proximity. We also looked in a follow-up work uh, uh, with Andrea Filippetti and Simona Iamarino and how this works when we look at university industry collaborations. And the interesting result there is again the role of, of stars, is the, again the role of academic stars that really can convince firms to collaborate with universities. So it's more about the reputation of the star than the physical proximity between the university and the private firm. So these makes the message to policymakers much more nuanced. It's really about the quality of the system, it's about the uh, information asymmetries that need to be overcome between universities, uh, research centers, and private firms for collaboration to happen. Physical proximity, the development of clusters of hub is not per se a condition for collaboration to happen, and therefore for spillover for innovation to spread from the research infrastructure into the local environment. So the final question, uh, and I have uh, five minutes, um, is, okay, can we use public policies? In sense, if we put money on the table, if, I, if we think that collaboration is something that deserves a public support, if we put money on the table, can we artificially generate collaborations? Is it something that we can facilitate by means of public subsidies? So what we did in order to answer this question is to look at a very specific scheme. So we had a sort of in vitro experiment in that the Italian government put uh, 1 billion uh, euros from the EU structural funds that probably for certain standards is not a big amount of money, but uh, uh, for uh, research and innovation in particular in Italy uh, is, is a really big, it's one of the largest uh, uh, public uh, uh, investments uh, funded by the government in terms of uh, uh, a firm level to, to support industrial uh, innovation. And basically this program was giving money for firms to work together, for firms to collaborate uh, in consortia, so in group of firms, as well as with public research centers and universities. So they were submitting joint uh, applications. So what we wanted to see if, and, and this feature, this collaborative feature has become a very influential fe feature of funding schemes uh, in, uh, um, through the smart specialization uh, narrative and uh, uh, Horizon 2020 and more so in Horizon Europe. So what we were wondering, okay, is, is this collaborative like effort, uh, giving a prize for collaboration is something that is producing an impact? So we try to assess what feature of these innovation programs uh, work best and what is the impact of value added when uh, innovation programs try and leverage links with public research centers and universities. 
So to do this, we had a unique collection of data, uh, having access to all beneficiary data. So we had information of all firms that applied for this scheme, successful and unsuccessful. Through the tax code, we could get access to full balance sheet data from these firms, and then from the social security uh, data, we could trace all their workers as well as uh, uh, all their patterns. So we have full information of what happens to these firms. Uh, every single euro can be traced payment by payment from Brussels down to the final firm. So that we could basically assess this program using a regression discontinuity design approach. Basically what happened, um, all projects were ranked with a score and we look at all programs, all uh, projects that were deemed uh, eligible for funding by uh, the selector, by the selection committee. So the quality of all the programs is above the minimum threshold, the minimum threshold that makes the, that, that states that they are uh, deserve, that they deserve funding. However, likely enough, the Italian government finished the money. So some of the programs that were eligible for funding were not actually funded for a reason that was exogenous to the quality of the programs themselves. So does not depend endogenously on the quality of the programs, but depends on an exogenous factor, the lack of funding uh, from the uh, Italian government. Therefore, we use this discontinuity to uh, build our counterfactual. We had firms that submitted programs of comparable quality when compared to those that actually received the funding, and we use them as our counterfactual. So what we uh, 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 focus on is the, the heterogeneity of the program. So we don't want um, a zero one answer. I'm not really interested in saying, okay, did this program work or not on average? I'm more interested in the program heterogeneity. What features of the program offered highest returns? And okay, this is about the identification strategy, but so it is what feature of the program uh, 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 mattered the most. And in particular for the purpose of this talk is the question, collaborating with the public research center. Is it something that was giving firms an extra boost? And collaborating with other partners, with other firms, having a large partnership, is it something that gives us a premium? And then we go through other characteristics uh, of, the, of, of the scheme in order to give insights to the commission on how to improve these schemes uh, when, uh, for the next programming period, basically. So the, the insights when looking at investments, at value added, at employment are not particularly uh, reassuring. We have a mild positive impact on employment, but in general, collaboration with public research center does not seem to be particularly fruitful for the firms involved in these programs. Um, why is that? The idea is again that it's very hard to uh, facilitate collaboration. It's very hard to uh, give incentives for collaboration to happen. Uh, for many firms, uh, when they are interviewed more qualitatively, the burden of participation is sometimes higher than the benefits from participation into the program itself because of the complications that are linked with uh, dealing and complying with EU, EU rules. So here, like we have, I think, very interesting insights on how we can design programs that facilitate this type of, um, of collaborations. We really need to think about what are the features uh, that these programs should have in order to make sure that effects materialize and we don't observe, like we, 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 we do uh, in the analysis, uh, significant displacement effects whereby public money basically replace investments that that would have done anyway by uh, private firms. So large research infrastructure, uh, we, we need to be aware that are difficult to embed in regional innovation ecosystems and local strategies. This is a challenge. Collaboration does not happen naturally simply because the research infrastructure is there. There is something that needs to be done and there is some work to be done on the ecosystem to embed this investment into the local ecosystem. Even targeted incentives for collaborative activities might not reach the, inten the intended target. So we really need sound evidence on how to maximize the effectiveness of these schemes. This is a, challenge, this is a complex challenge for regional innovation strategies. The development of new proximities can be facilitated and supported so as to overcome the barriers for collaboration. So we need a diagnostic stage and uh, a policy stage. Uh, dedicated processes are needed to identify areas where the highest potential for collaboration is possible. L like I said, again, based of a, of a diagnosis of what the center is doing and what the external ecosystem is, is doing. Uh, more research is definitely needed in order to understand what tools and what features of the programs might work uh, in practice in this area. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Okay, so we have one question I'm getting from the organizers. So is there a question for Ricardo? Or people need coffee? Coffee? A comment, John. At SCFC, we did a number of studies of um, the Darsbury and Harwell campus, and the Darsbury experience was interesting because a lot of companies chose to locate there in order to work with other companies, not with the public research uh, facility itself. The public research facility put the location on the map and made it visible, but often they wanted to work, uh, collaborate among themselves, uh, and it, it was somehow a signal of public investment in the region which is a very complicated message, but an important one, like a new highway or a new bridge would have been. Uh, so so th this is, I, I agree with your conclusions, it's interesting and subtle. Absolutely, I mean, this is in line with this idea that collaboration, basically the, the, the public is signaling something that creates a sorting, so certain types of firms are going there, so given that we have a joint sorting mechanism, then I know that I have next to me firms that deserve my attention, and so the scanning costs are lower. Yeah, yeah exactly. Then the problem is, like when you have areas that are in need of injections of innovation, like how can you create this type of ecosystem if you want artificially? Is the signaling enough? Okay, so are there other questions? Sorry, I was getting a time check there from the organizers. No? Okay, so what we'll do now is we'll have half an hour, 20, yeah. half an hour until quarter to, quarter to four. Uh, and at quarter to four, there'll be a panel session here, so a chance to discuss in more depth everything you've been listening to for the last uh, few hours and uh, get more reactions from, from the floor as well from the panel. Thank you, see you in half an hour.